So today we are going to be talking about our maritime empires and resistance to them. So uh, unit four, as I uh, mentioned during uh, the live lesson on Thursday, unit four is about the transoceanic connections that are happening as a result of the land-based empires we uh, introduced ourselves to in unit three. So a lot of things are going on uh, during this time, uh, there are many continuities, but there are also uh, changes. Um, when we say maritime empires, when we mean sea-based empires, they transformed uh, commerce from local small-scale trading, uh, mostly based on barter, to large-scale international trade using gold and silver. So these empires employed new economic models, which we'll talk about, uh, like joint stock companies. Um, New ocean trade routes were opened, uh, which aided in the rise of this extended uh, global economy that will really endure into the present day. And then, of course, the Atlantic trades, trading system involved the movement of uh, slave labor and the mixing of African-American and European cultures uh, and peoples, uh, with all groups contributing to cultural synthesis, uh, some of which vol was voluntary, too much of which was involuntary. Uh, silver, sugar and slavery uh, were the three S's uh, that led to the development of these uh, mercantilist empires, as we will, as we'll see. So uh, speaking of some of those economic changes that are occurring, uh, the goal of these uh, empires was wealth accumulation, right? So in the, in the 17th century, Europeans generally measured the wealth of a country uh, in how much gold or silver it had in its treasury. So to achieve this wealth, countries used economic strategies des designed to sell as many goods as they could to other countries in order to obtain maximum amounts of gold and silver. So to keep their wealth, though, countries wanted to spend as little of this, uh, these precious metals as possible on goods from other countries, which leads to the rise of mercantilism, right, as you see, uh, because mercantilism is about creating this positive balance of trade. The accumulation of capital, uh, which is basically means material wealth that's available to produce more wealth, uh, in Western Europe grew as entrepreneurs and merchants joined these long distance trading markets. Um, so you had capital change hands from entrepreneurs to laborers, and that put laborers in a better position to become consumers, maybe even investors, and kind of laying the groundwork for the emergence of um, this in-between class of individuals that we'll really see take off during the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and then, of course, actual wealth increased with gold and silver coming in from uh, the quote-unquote new world. Now, the transformation to a trade-based economy that uses gold and silver is known as the commercial revolution. And the commercial revolution affected all regions of the world, and it resulted from four key factors. Uh, the development of European colonies, of course, right? So the creation of the colonies allowed for this balance of trade formula to, to work out more effectively for the uh, colonizing country. Uh, the opening of new trade uh, routes, ocean trade routes, um, population growth, and inflation, which the inflation was caused partly by the pressure of the increasing population and then partly by the increased amount of gold and silver that was mined and put into circulation because if there's more gold available than the gold or and silver, then each uh, ounce of gold and silver was less valuable in relation to all the other available ounces. It's the same way inflation works with um, cash currency that we, uh, with which we're more familiar with today. Uh, the high rate of inflation uh, that happened as a result of this in the 16th and uh, 17th centuries is actually called the price revolution. And again, all of this creates the conditions, the environment for uh, mer a mercantile economic system. So, so what are some of the things that we see, the distinguishing characteristics of this transoceanic trade? Well, aiding uh, the rise of this extended global economy was the creation of what's called joint stock companies. Those are owned by investors who bought stock 
or shares in them. So it's kind of a spreading of the wealth. The spreading of the wealth also means the spreading of the risk, right? People invested capital in such mm-hmm. companies and shared both the profits and the risk, right? Uh, of exploration and of these trading uh, ventures. It was a joint stock company that led to the uh, development of the Virginia uh, colony. So um, people were hoping to essentially strike it rich. It was like a gamble, right? They offered limited liability, uh, which means that an investor was not responsible for a company's debts or other liabilities beyond whatever amount that they themselves invested. So if the company went belly up or the venture went belly up, the only thing they were out is what they had put into it. They didn't have to share the cost uh, with other people. Uh, The developing European middle class that I referenced had capital to invest from successful businesses in their home countries. And then they also had money that they could use to purchase imported luxuries. So uh, joint stock companies were really popular among the Dutch, the English, and the French in the 17th century. And two uh, examples that we often cite of these are the British East India Company, uh, which was created in 1600, and then the Dutch East India Company, which was created in 1602. So in Spain and Portugal, though, the government did most of the investing itself uh, through grants to certain explorers. So think about like uh, the commissioning of Christopher Columbus, right? So joint uh, stock companies were a driving force behind the maritime empires that we saw in in North, more so in North America, the Dutch, the British, to a lesser extent, the French, uh, than in South America. Um, Now the Dutch were long the commercial um, middlemen of Europe, which basically means they set up and maintain trade routes to Latin America, to North America, South Africa, Indonesia. Uh, Dutch ships were faster, they were lighter uh, than those of their rivals, uh, and um, they really allowed them to gain an early advantage. The Dutch East India Company was um, one of the most highly successful as a joint stock company and generated enormous profits, mainly from the Spice Islands uh, coming out of Southeast um, Asia. Uh, The Dutch were also pioneers in finance. You know, they created a stock exchange uh, the same year that the Dutch uh, East India Company was created in 1602. And then by 1609, uh, the Bank of Amsterdam uh, traded currency internationally. Uh, The Dutch standard of living was the highest in Europe. because you know goods such as diamonds linen pottery even tulip bulbs which were considered luxury at the time uh, passed through dutch traders uh, unfortunately france and england were not as lucky because uh, early in the 18th uh, century both kind of uh, fell into these speculative uh, schemes uh, something we call refer to as a bubble um, where they were based on the sale of shares to investors who were promised a certain return after a frenzy of buying drove up the price of each share. It, they realized there was no there there, the bubble burst, and the investors lose the money that they invested. I also have on here triangle trade because the Europeans' um, desire for enslaved workers in the Americas combined with Portugal's um, uh, establishment of trading posts in West Africa uh, allowed for Africa to become a new source of labor, which, as we talked about on Thursday, was in the eyes of the Europeans necessitated by the decimation of the native populations. So enslaved Africans became part of this complex trading system known as triangular trade. Uh, because voyages often had these three segments, as you see here. A ship might carry European manufactured goods, such as firearms, to West Africa, and then from there transport enslaved Africans to the Americas, load up with sugar or tobacco, and take that to Europe. And sugar, as we mentioned on Thursday, was the most profitable good from the Americas. And then by 1700s, uh, in fact, uh, the 1700s Caribbean sugar Uh, production and uh, rum production, which is made from sugar, were bankrolling uh, uh, Britain, France, and and the Netherlands. Now, what, um, uh, one last thing I think I had on, yes, rivalries. Yes, so after uh, 
Europeans, uh, quote unquote, discovered uh, the Americas, uh, their focus really became on Atlantic uh, trade. Uh, remember, the whole impetus for Columbus's journey was to find a sea route to India. But when uh, the Spanish, the French, and the British uh, stumbled upon um, the North and South American continents, they kind of uh, ignored, to, for lack of a better term, Indian Ocean trade. But that's not to say that states did not continue to buy for control of those trading routes, particularly the Portuguese. Because remember, as a result of the Treaty of Tordesillas, the Portuguese were kind of cut out of the Americas. Um, the Portuguese did defeat uh, Muslim and Venetian uh, forces in a naval battle in the Arabian Sea in uh, 1509. Um, so that allowed them to continue their domination of this, uh, setting up these little trading posts along the coast of Africa to get to India from Europe. Uh, although when they tried to conquer Moroccan forces uh, in 1578, they were pushed back. Um, now, Morocco's victory did not last very long because they uh, got um, cocky after the defeating the Portuguese. They turned on the Songhai Kingdom, if you remember, we talked about that in, the, in uh, Unit uh, 1. And um, despite uh, the prohibition of waging war on another Muslim state, Morocco attacked Songhai with thousands of soldiers, camels, horses, and they had eight cannons. Um, and other firearms. The Moroccan forces uh, traveled months uh, essentially across the desert to reach Songhai. And then in 1590, uh, the um, Songhai, despite their greater number of fighters, were overcome by the Moroccans and their empire collapsed. And uh, this kind of divide and conquer mindset allowed the Spanish and the Portuguese Portuguese to take over a lot of this territory. Why am I saying all this? Because again, it plants the seeds for what's going to happen with the scramble for Africa in the 19th century. And it's also important to note that the conflict, the controversy over Indian Ocean trade is playing out in Africa because it's kind of a way station uh, via ocean route to the Indian Ocean trade network. Changes in continuities in uh, trade. Obviously, uh, the trading networks involved this new global circulation of goods, wealth, and labor. Silver from the Spanish colonies in the Americas flowed to Asia, where Asians were very eager to exchange their goods, silks, porcelain, and still for silver. Remember, one of the problems in early trade, especially uh, when we were talking about the networks of exchange in Unit 2, is Europe didn't really have anything for Asia uh, that Asia wanted. Europe didn't really have anything to offer Asia, whereas Europe wanted the luxuries coming out of Asia. That changed when silver entered the equation. And you remember doing your um, silver trading route maps. It's one of the reasons why uh, that was such a significant part of that unit and why we did that as a separate uh, project, because that's going to lay the groundwork and really set the scene for the economic exploitation we see of uh, of East Asia, and you know we can uh, that's an allusion to the Opium Wars, right? Think about that, uh, and the role that silver and this balance trade balance played in that. Um, we also had the emergence of new monopolies, um, and that's how these patterns of trade really maintained, uh, because the monopolies were chartered by European rulers. And they granted certain merchants, uh, usually through a joint stock company or even the government, exclusive trading rights. So an example of this would be the Spanish government, that established, uh, which established a monopoly first over all the to domestic tobacco grown uh, and then over all the tobacco grown in its American colonies. So the profits from this monopoly uh, greatly enriched the Spanish government because they didn't have any competitors, right? And when you have competitors, you have to keep prices low. Without competitors, you don't need to keep prices low. So it got to the point that the income from tobacco alone accounted for one third of the money that Spain was bringing in. Um, now, you also have um, uh, political uh, changes, right? So earlier land-based empires, such as the those of the 
Romans, some of the caliphates we've talked about, even the Mongols, uh, they all had to deal with uh, this question of, of what do you do with co conquered people's uh, traditions and cultures. Uh, some, the, some of these empires allowed traditions to exist, you know, the Mongols, some, some did not. Some tried to uh, you know, graft their ways and their culture onto those civilizations, think of the Romans. So uh, European empires um, in the Americas, though, were far different from these land-based empires. The Spanish and Portuguese uh, basically uh, erased uh, the basic social structures and many of the cultural traditions of the indigenous Americans uh, within a century of arrival. Um, and these actions not only erased a, a culture, but they depopulated the Americas. So not only did we have a loss of a population of a people, we also have a lost culture and history. One of the reasons in Unit 1 why, why the information we had on Mesoamerican cultures and Native American cultures is relatively limited is because so much of that history is lost. Much of uh, those cultures relied on oral tradition, and with European arrival, we lost a lot of that. Uh, indigenous political structures in Latin America were replaced by Spanish and Portuguese political administrations. Spanish royalty appointed viceroys to act as administrators, and they were representatives of the Spanish crown. Um, and to keep them from operating independently of the crown, um, Spain established uh, royal, royal courts um, to which Spanish settlers could appeal uh, the decisions of viceroys. Um, slow transportation, communication networks uh, between, I mean, because literally you're crossing an ocean though, made it difficult for the Spanish crown to direct, to have and maintain direct control over what they called New Spain. So um, as a result, the Spanish throne did not uh, focus much at all on uh, colonial affairs in, Western, in the Western hemisphere in the Americas. Now, as I said, the indigenous people uh, the indigenous peoples of the Americas lost a great deal of their culture and history as a result of the conquistadors, such as Hernan Cortes coming into Mexico. Uh, you know, they ordered the burning of native books. Uh, uh, they, um, uh, very few firsthand accounts from indigenous peoples. Um, uh, you know, the Spanish burned all the Aztec, nearly all the Aztec documents. Uh, the uh, much of the voices in the oral tradition were silenced. Spanish and Portu uh, Portuguese conquerors transplanted their own languages and religion into the Americas. It's, the Roman Catholicism is still predominant in, in Mesoamerica. Um, so it, certainly it, it's enough to call, that's why we refer to it as this lost culture because there's so much, <clears throat> we really don't know uh, what we don't know. Uh, now, at the same time, we did have a one continuity we have from this time period is ongoing regional markets. So this is something we saw in Unit 2, right? Uh, regional markets maintained in, in Afro-Eurasia. We did have improved shipping, which offered merchants the opportunity to increase the volume of their products. Uh, but you still had this notion of, you know, Southeast Asian trading network, in, more broadly Indian Ocean trading network. You had... Uh, a Mediterranean trading network, you had a Trans-Saharan trading network. So you still had these regional um, trading networks, but the volume of goods and services being traded increased as a result of this global trade. The Atlantic slave trade, uh, again, the effects of it cannot be overstated. And, and one of the impacts it had was in West African kingdoms, uh, the regions from which these slaves are being pulled. Um, the loss of so many people due to slavery slowed population growth. Uh, many leaders formed corrupt arrangements with European powers. Uh, trade competition led to violence among their societies. Europeans kind of divided and conquered. Um, it made African slave raiding kingdoms economically dependent on goods from Europe. Uh, so as a result, these societies were slow to develop in their own right or more complex economies where they could produce their own goods. So already you have this cycle of dependency that's creating, that sets the stage for the scramble for Africa we see in the 19th century. Um, 
economically, uh, African societies that did participate in the slave trade became richer from selling slaves to Europeans. Um, but uh, this had political effects because when a society exchanged slaves for guns, its raiders easily took advantage of um, neighboring societies that didn't have firearms and that refused to participate. So without firearms, neighboring groups could not fight off slave raids. So raiding societies became even richer and more fortified, and that motivated these societies and local leaders to uh, contribute to the slave trade. And then those most affected by the slave trade uh, were the peoples of the civilizations of West Africa in what would be present day uh, Ghana, where uh, most Africans were kidnapped or sold. Uh, so gender distributions in those regions as a result of this became very much uh, imbalanced uh, because more than two thirds of the slaves taken were males, right? Because they were taken for labor. So a male slave uh, was more, uh, in, in more in higher demand. And so the resulting predominance of women led to a rise of uh, polygamy or having more than one wife. And it forced uh, women to take on roles that had traditionally been assigned uh, to men. Uh, and then we also do have um, the uh, introduction of new crops to Africa, uh, just like we saw new crops in Europe, maize, corn, peanuts, um, cassava. And those become staples in the African diet and they kind of help generate some new um, some new population growth. Uh, then we have um, belief systems, right? So the increase uh, and intensity of the connections that we're seeing here as a result of maritime trade and these transoceanic connections um, led to the emergence of syncretic belief systems. So you have African religions in the Americas uh, that combined with different um, uh, aspects of Christianity, usually Roman Catholicism, brought over from the Spanish and the Portuguese, uh, with uh, West African religious traditions such as drumming, dancing, and a belief in spirits uh, that could take over and act through a person, right? So some examples of these are the Santeria, which means the way of the saints. Uh, that was originally an African faith, but it became popular in Cuba and then traveled throughout Latin America on into North America. Uh, Vodun, which means spirit or deity, it originated in uh, the Congo area um, and uh, it was popular among uh, Haitian slaves. And then um, uh, can, Candomblé means dance to honor the gods. It's a combination of Yoruba, Fawn, and Bantu beliefs uh, from different sections of Africa that emerged out of, out of uh, Brazil. Uh, enslaved Africans in the United States, or what would have become the United States, uh, laid the roots of the African American church, a hybrid of Christianity and African spiritual traditions uh, that really remains one of the most uh, stable and oldest institutions in the African American communities. Um, there will obviously, we know from our talking about our uh, land based trade in Unit 2, that there was Islam in Africa, and about one in 10 of the enslaved Africans did practice Islam. And while some of the men who sailed with Columbus uh, may have been Muslims, uh, the uh, enslaved Africans really became the first significant presence of Islam in the Americas. And then, of course, we know in Latin America, the role of the Catholic Church uh, was significant. Um, you had several Catholic religious orders in Europe, um, the Jesuits, uh, the Franciscans. They sent missionaries to Latin America to convert people to Catholicism. The missionaries, in fact, were so successful that most of Latin America remains uh, strong, strongly and devoutly Roman Catholic. Um, there are examples of religious syncretism um, coming out of these Spanish colonies, Catholic Saints Days that uh, coincide with days honored indigenous, uh, by indigenous peoples were celebrated. Um, so, for example, Mexico, a cult developed around the dark complexion version of Guadalupe, who um, was revered for her abilities uh, to perform miracles. And then of course you do have global impacts. So um, religious impacts are not just happening in the Americas, uh, but syncretic religions develop in Afro-Eurasia. Uh, Sufism, which we talked about in previous units, uh, which focused on personal salvation, helped spread Islam, was influenced by Sikhism, blended Muslim and Hindu beliefs, 
uh, Akbar, who we've already talked about, tried to resolve some of the conflicts between Muslims and Hindus by merging some of the beliefs together. Uh, religions also played a role in conflicts, right? The more that this interaction occurs, uh, s- split between the Sunnis and the Shias, which we talked about uh, being a divide in the Ottoman and Safavid Empire in Unit 3. You had the Catholic Protestant split, uh, split that happened in the Reformation. So uh, it, the more interaction you have, the, like the more syncretism and blending of cultures you will have, but also the more conflict that will emerge as a result of that blending. Okay? And uh, not to say that this um, colonial influence was not without resistance, right? So that's going to be where we will end today is kind of the internal and external resistance to some of this power and authority. So as empires developed and changed, um, uh, many groups resisted uh, state expansion uh, through a variety of, 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 of ways, right? So uh, by the 17th century, uh, Dutch and English had basically pushed the Portuguese out of South Asia, right? We saw that early on. Uh, the Portuguese uh, then looked to Africa as an alternative, and that's where it carried out slave raids since the, 14th, uh, the 15th century to build uh, trading post colonies. But then in 1624, um, uh, Dongo in South Central Africa, which is uh, present day uh, Angolia, uh, let, organized a slave raid. Actually, they had a female leader who organized a slave raid. Um, and in exchange for protection from neighboring powers and an end for Portugal's raiding for slaves, um, uh, she became an ally of Portugal. She was baptized as a Christian um, with the governor of the Portuguese colony as her godfather. Uh, But over time, the alliance broke down um, and her people fled west, taking over a state called Matatamba. So she then incited a rebellion in Dongo and allied with the Dutch and offered runaway slaves freedom. Uh, in exchange for their support and helping overthrow um, the Portuguese. And she ended up ruling for decades, um, making it a very successful, successful state. Uh, now, in contrast uh, to uh, what we saw in with the Portuguese, the Fronde disturbance uh, in uh, uh, France was basically a civil protest, civil unrest between 1648 and 1653, which... Uh, were people upset with the monarchy, right? They were trying to limit the the uh, expanse of that absolute power that we talked about um, in uh, in the in Unit uh, Three. Now, in contrast to, uh, uh, to to Portugal, also is Spain, where pressures. Uh, I'm sorry, is uh, Russia, where pressure comes from the inside, from internally. Um, so conditions had improved for the serfs uh, in Western Europe by the 14th century, uh, but this did not happen in Russia, right? Serfs were still behind. Remember, Russia's going to always be a little bit behind the rest of Europe. And so wars during the 14th and 15th century weakened the central government and increased the power of the nobility. So as demand for grain increased, nobles imposed very harsh conditions on their serfs. Russian serfs have a long history of being uh, oppressed. You know, first the Mongols and then later Russian princes uh, forced heavy tribute and taxes out of them. And so these uh, Russian peasants were in debt and ended up losing their land and forced into serfdom, right? The practice of serfdom benefited the government because it kept the peasants under control, uh, regulated by the nobility. Right, serfdom benefited landowners because it provided free labor, and although townspeople were also controlled and not permitted to move um, freely to other cities, the serfs were practically slaves. Right, and their labor was bought and sold along with the lands of their owners. So, as Russian territory expanded west uh, to um, the Baltic and then east to Siberia, the institution of serfdom went right along with it, right? So Russia is an agricultural state, and that kept uh, the demand for serfs pretty, pretty high. So um, 
southwest of, Mar of Moscow near the Black Sea, peasants who were very skilled fighters uh, lived on the grassy and treeless steppes. Many were runaway serfs who lived in small groups uh, trying to uh, move past the reach of the government. Um, some of them were influenced by the ways of um, uh, neighboring nomadic descendants of the Mongols. And these were known as the, uh, the, um, the Cossacks. And they were sometimes at odds uh, with the central government of the czars. Uh, and they were fiercely independent uh, warriors. Sometimes they were helpful to the government because they could be hired as uh, mercenaries uh, to defend Russia against Sweden, against um, even Ottoman forces. Um, the Cossacks, though, were important to uh, Russian expansions in the Ural Mountains. And it got to a point, though, where a Cossack known as Pugashev uh, began a peasant rebellion, saying, look, we're being used by the government of Russia. It's time for us to stand up and fight for our own rights. So he led a rebellion in 1774 against Catherine the Great for giving the nobility power over the serfs on their lands in exchange for political loyalty, which basically left peasants without ties to the state. So he falsely claimed uh, to be Catherine's murdered husband, uh, Peter III, he gathered a following of discontented peasants, uh, people from different ethnic groups, fellow Cossacks. And at one point, they controlled the territory between um, the Vol Volga River and the Urals. And within a year, though, uh, the Russian army had easily tamped down the rebellion, captured Pugachev, and executed him. Uh, unfortunately, the Pugachev rebellion uh, caused Catherine to increase her oppression of the peasants. Uh, in return for the support of nobles to help prevent future revolts. In South Asia, uh, in the 17th, uh, 16th, 17th centuries, the Mughal Empire controlled much of what is now India and Pakistan. Uh, the Mughals centralized government and spread Persian art and culture, as well as Islam. However, uh, much of the population remained Hindu, and a, war a Hindu warrior group called the Maratha uh, fought the Mughals in a series of battles uh, from 1680 to uh, 1710, 1707. Uh, so they created the Hindu Maratha Empire, which lasted until 1818 and basically brought an end to Mughal rule in India. Spanish Empire was not immune from revolt either. So Spain experienced rebellions like the Pueblo Revolt, which took place in 1680 against the Spanish in what is now modern day New Mexico. Uh, the Pueblo and Apache were two indigenous groups who fought colonizers trying to force religious conversions upon the people. They did end up killing about 400 Spaniards and drive the rest out of the, um, out of the area. They destroyed churches, although as the populations uh, got decimated, uh, decimated by disease, the Spanish ended up reconquering the era, area in 1692. And then, of course, uh, all of us are products of the uh, resistance to the British Empire. Uh, England actually defeated Spanish colonists uh, and took control of much of Jamaica, Jamaica in 1655. But slaves in the Caribbean and even former Spanish territories uh, fought to gain freedom in what were known as the Maroon Wars. Maroons were descendants of runaway African slaves. Uh, they escaped their owners and formed independent um, settlements. Uh, Queen Nanny, uh, herself an escaped slave, united all of the Maroons on the island. And then Jamaicans uh, still recognize her as a national hero. Uh, slave revolts uh, were common in the Americas, especially uh, where um, enslaved Africans outnumbered uh, free Europeans. Uh, the first recorded slave revolt in what is now the United States was the uh, Gloucester County Rebellion in Virginia in 1663. Uh, here, enslaved Africans and white indentured servants actually conspired together to demand their freedom from the governor. Authorities found out about the plans, the conspiracy, they ambushed them, they arrested them, so it didn't really materialize. Uh, Medicom's War uh, was the final major attempt of indigenous peoples to drive the British out of New England. Uh, it spread throughout New England 
uh, it was a conflict between Native Americans and the settlers. It uh, resulted in the destruction of 12, 12 towns. Uh, some, uh, some Native American groups actually sided on, with the English because they had promised them some land, um, such as the Mohegan and the, and the Pequot. Uh, although uh, Native American peoples did live, continue to live in the region, the war ended with basically the uh, subjugation of the uh, Wampanoag people to the English colonists. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as uh, King Philip's War because that was kind of the derisive name that they gave uh, Metacomet, the uh, Native American chief, uh, and obviously an English name. Uh, there were also power struggles and resistance that happened internally in England itself. In 1685, James II became king. He was Catholic, uh, and his... Uh, Anti-Protestant uh, measures enraged many English people. Remember, as a result of the Protestant Reformation and Henry VIII, England had converted to Protestantism. Uh, so a group of nobles invited William of Orange, who was actually James' nephew and son-in-law, to invade England and become the new Protestant king. He agreed, arrived in England in 1688. James fled to France, which was Catholic-friendly. And then in 1689, William and his wife Mary II, who was actually James's daughter, uh, became their uh, began their joint rule of England. And both William and Mary were Protestant, and the English throne remained Protestant after that, and remains Protestant to this day. So the English people actually called this the Glorious Revolution or the Bloodless Revolution. Uh, and it actually ended up strengthening the power of Parliament, which passed a law forbidding Catholics to rule England. And that's still in effect today. Um, so it, it took place without much violence, but religious tensions continued in England uh, and throughout much of the world, as we will see. So those are some of the main uh, resistance um, to uh, colonial rule, both internal and to in, in imperial power, um, so colonial rule, external resistance, and then internal resistance to imperial power in and of itself. That uh, we will move on uh, as we continue our review of Unit 4 uh, later next week, talking and discussing uh, the changes to society happening around this time, as well as uh, some of the examples or further examples of continuity and changes that we see during this time period. If you have any questions, let me know. Take care.